Okay. Hey, everybody. This is the 3DM webinar on practical strategies for leading scattered church. And um, Bob Ronglian and I are going to be hosting this webinar uh, for you, with you. Um, I am Gina Mueller, and I'm calling in from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm getting to use a closed down coffee shop uh, Wi Fi while we're uh, all sheltering in place. So that's a fun, fun space to call in from. Um, I get to help lead the national team and so offer some leadership to the team. Uh, Bob, do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, I live out in Los Angeles. I've been part of uh, 3D movements for 12 or 13 years. Uh, Pam and I have been overseeing the, the western half of North America for about five years or so. Um, yep. Excellent. So Bob and I are really excited um, to be here with all of you guys having this conversation today. I think it's safe to say that it's been an unexpected four or five weeks um, for all of us. And every single church has become scattered church overnight with COVID-19 shelter in place orders. And so um, as we're processing uh, how we respond in this moment as leaders, to be honest, the season probably is gonna continue longer than any of us would hope. And uh, I'm just, I'm playing into the future and just curiously wondering if as social distancing um, lifts, as those kind of recommendations start to lift, I wonder if people are gonna re-engage in social uh, interactions at varying levels um, because the virus still exists. Uh, I also came across an article this morning that said, um, it was out of Harvard, that said something about um, D varying measures of social distancing recommendations are likely going to continue through 2022. That is two years, friends. And so uh, the reality for us as leaders is that uh, really this isn't just a quick fix. We can't just, um, you know, quickly calibrate, qu quickly adjust, and hope that we can get back to some semblance of a new normal here in a couple weeks. This is going to go on for for a bit. And so what that means is that this really is an amazing opportunity for us to learn in real time how to lead scattered church. And it just might be something that, that really will help us make missional disciples. And so just to set up our time together, we have a little bit less than an hour now. And so the flow of our time together, uh, Bob and I are going to share some thoughts here at the beginning, offer some strategies, and our hope is that you really can walk away with some really practical things to put into practice during this season. Um, we wanna leave some time for some Q&A at the end. And so um, as, we're, as we're rolling through this kind of content, sharing our thoughts, I would love it if you would write down what questions you have, because we wanna have a conversation at the end and just process through some things together. So keep track of your questions. Um, if it's helpful, you can type your questions into the chat. Um, and we can come back to those and kind of scroll through the questions that you had as we get to the end. So keep track of your questions. We want to have some conversation um, towards the end and talk together. So Bob, do you want to get us started? Sure. Um, it, just from a, a biblical perspective, it's interesting that one way you can frame uh, the, the life and the mission of Jesus is to think of him spending three years gathering his disciples and gathering an extended spiritual family and investing in them and training them and modeling a new way of life for them. And then to think of the Great Commission and Pentecost as the scattering uh, of the church as he sends out his disciples as apostles uh, to, as he says, to the ends of the earth. Um, and then it's interesting to, as you read the book of Acts, to see the similar dynamic where the followers of Jesus gathered together in Jerusalem, experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, saw a tremendous breakthrough within the city of Jerusalem, um, but still hadn't really fulfilled that promise of Acts 1.8, where Jesus says that they will be his witnesses, not just in Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. And then we come to Acts 8, uh, verse 1, and we see how the persecution of the followers of Jesus is starting to ramp up uh, under Saul's leadership and following Stephen's stoning. 
And uh, it says there uh, that there was a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so it's, uh, it's as if it takes this, this pressure of persecution to kind of break the followers of Jesus out of their comfort zone in the city of Jerusalem and to begin really fulfilling that broader perspective of the Great Commission, that they are going to go uh, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And, and so seeing the church and the movement of Jesus as a, as a movement that gathers and scatters is uh, really at the very core of, uh, of the Gospels and, and of the New Testament vision of the church. And uh, oftentimes the gathering of the church has become the default, the primary, or even the exclusive way that we have seen and understood church. Um, but we're in, a, we're in a season now, obviously, where it's not persecution, but like that Acts 8 situation, we've been forced into to kind of confront what does it mean to be the scattered church? And of course, it's the, it's the scattering, the disbursement, the sending of the followers of Jesus that really drives uh, the mission of Jesus to, uh, to reach all those even to the ends of the earth. And so uh, we can see this as a, as a difficult, challenging time that we have to learn how to adjust to and cope with. But we can also see this as an exciting opportunity that God is, is using this terrible pandemic, awful as it is, uh, to open us up and teach us again, what does it mean not only to gather, but also to scatter? What does it mean to function as the body of Christ when we can't gather in large public gatherings? And that was the case for the next three centuries after Acts 8, is that the church was under various uh, forms and times of persecution and pressure that prevented them from gathering in large public gatherings most of the time. And yet the, the mission of Jesus continued, the movement of Jesus thrived because they learned how to be a scattered church. And so we really feel as, as the 3DM leadership, this is an opportunity for us as well to recapture and learn again how to lead and how to function as the body of Christ uh, that is dispersed and scattered. So that's kind of, that's just the background for what we're going to be talking about. Excellent. Yeah, so as we are uh, looking together at what, is it, what does it mean for us to lead a scattered church, uh, we've got about eight different uh, tips or strategies that we want to kind of walk through together with you. So the first strategy, strategy number one, is development over delivery. Development over delivery. So this is a value that elevates the development of everyone over delivery by the experts. So scattered church really is decentralized church. So we imagine the people of God full of the Holy Spirit, they've all been deployed, right? So they can't come to you and they can't even gather together. And so we really need to, to be looking at how we resource them for that. And so what that means is this really is a season for us to think about how we equip and train and empower the everyday Jesus follower. Um, there's lots of services that are happening online, and that's great. We're grateful for the technology to help us connect. But as you're leading your church or those that you're discipling through pandemic, uh, it's helpful to have um, kind of elevate this value of, of development over delivery. Think about how you can grow some skills in spiritual disciplines um, or give people tools to even lead people in their household. So some really practical ex examples. Um, if you're offering an online Sunday service, perhaps there's a little space in there where you're leading people through a prayer time. And this, this can be a time where, where together you're praying for the sick around the city. Maybe you're praying for those in authority, those who are out of work across the city, um, school teachers that are trying to figure out how to teach remotely, um, people who are still working and a bit fearful about it. As you're praying through, you know, maybe you're, you're giving a directive, a guided prayer time, but rather than you as the pastor on the screen, just leading people through the prayer time, maybe it's a guided time where you say, now we're going to pray through this and invite everyone to practice praying from their living room with the other people in their household and give them uh, some guidance and some tools through that. 
So that's one example. Perhaps, um, perhaps you offer a bit of training and, and an outline to guide people through how to lead worship as an experience with the other people in their household. Bob wrote an excellent blog about that, giving some practical tools and even an outline to be able to do that a, a couple weeks ago. Similarly, um, what if we offer some detail for people on how to serve communion with their family around the table and create, just give some real kind of gritty spirituality, some, some gritty practices for people um, to grab hold of and have, have handles for how to lead uh, in their own household. So development over delivery. In other words, how can we resource our people? How can we really train them to live as disciples of Jesus during this time, rather than just delivering things for them to watch and observe virtually? Another idea I'd add to that is I've, I saw one church that was doing daily devotionals, um, but they were being recorded and posted online by different members of the church. So it was another way of sort of highlighting that this doesn't have to just be led by the pastors or the staff. All right, so strategy number two is uh, reframing the mission. You know, suddenly the, the circumstances have forced us all to change the way that we're doing things. And it's an excellent time for us to go back to the question of what is our mission really about? What, what, what is our, our purpose? You know, Jesus said to the scribe who asked him, about what is most important. He said, it's loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12. Uh, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Uh, Jesus gave that great commission to the disciples in Matthew 28. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So what is the mission? What is the focus? What is the purpose of what we're doing? And if you're on this call, I'm sure this is not your stated mission, but practically many churches, the, the, the functional mission has been get as many people as possible into your building and into your programs um, for a greater good, but that being the primary way that most churches function. And now that option is, is off the table. So what a great opportunity for us to reframe and maybe refocus and even redefine what is the mission of our church and, and where does discipleship fit into that mission? Where does reaching the lost fit into that mission? And uh, this might be an opportunity for you to be processing with your leaders, first of all, that, that question of what is our mission? How do we define our mission? How do we express our mission? How do we carry out our mission? And then uh, to bring that into the wider conversation of your community and your congregation. And so just, uh, just think about, you know, you probably have a, a mission statement and you might ask yourself the question, what are the current situation, uh, how does it highlight that mission? Or how does it put that mission into a new perspective or a new context? And hopefully what it'll do is it'll help people to see that the mission of your church lies primarily outside the walls of your buildings. And, uh, and what a great <laughs> reminder that this current pandemic is not preventing us from our mission. In fact, if anything, it may be focusing us again on our mission. So reframe your mission. Excellent. Strategy number three is offer an imitable example. So if we're really in a season of development over delivery and what, what we're trying to do is resource all of our people to really know how to live and what it looks like to live as disciples of Jesus in real time in this moment, we want to give people real actual handles for that. So uh, what we found really helpful is to offer real time examples of what even what you're doing as a leader um, and drill down into the detail, offer loads of detail about what you're doing and how you're doing it so they have something to imitate. So in other words, as you're leading your people and you're, you're offering examples of ways that, that they can really follow Jesus and develop a lifestyle live, of living the ways of Jesus, don't just tell them what to do, but show them how, right? Offer as much detail as possible. Of course, if this is the first time 
if this is really changing how people engage in church and in, in their relationship with Jesus, and if this really truly is the first time where they're trying some of these things on their own rather than you, the pastor, or you, the leader, doing it for them, it's going to produce all kinds of kairos, right? That's okay. Um, probably you'll want to offer some space for them to, to mine out that kairos, to process that a little bit, uh, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but a few examples, just a really practical example of how you might give some detailed example from your own life for other people to imitate. So for me personally, during these weeks of shelter in place, I've personally found that predictable patterns have really kept me sane and grounded during this season. So predictable patterns are just simple rhythms on repeat. So everything for me personally, from prayer rhythms to taking a walk every afternoon, to our dinner rhythms as a family around the table. Those are just really simple, predictable patterns that have grounded me and been really helpful. But rather than just telling people to put some predictable patterns in place, I'm gonna tell them exactly what I'm doing so that they have something to imitate. So for example, um, for me, my prayer rhythm, I find it best, for me personally, it's easiest in the early morning hours. There's something about those early hours where my brain is the freshest and I feel like I can, I can connect with God easier. Um, I always make some coffee. And then the first thing that I do is I put on some worship music. There's something about worship that helps um, get me out of my head and help me connect with the Father. And then I'm going to read scripture for the day. I usually read the Moravian text. It's a really simple Bible reading plan that walks us through an Old Testament, New Testament psalm for the day. But what I'm doing as I'm reading that scripture is I'm looking for what really stands out to me. And if there's a verse or a chunk of scripture that really stands out to me, I'm going to let, I'm going to pull that out. I'm probably going to write it down. I, I usually have a journal sitting right, right next to me and I'm going to write it down. And what I'm looking for is how is God getting my attention today? And then that's what I'm going to pray into. And I'm probably going to talk to him about it. I'm probably going to ask him. Um, if there's anything that he has to say to me. So that's a really detailed way of how I spend time with the Father. And if I was doing this with those that I'm leading, I'm not going to only give my example. I might give, you know, like two, three, five examples, just short few minutes from, from different people in the congregation to offer different examples if I'm wanting to help people develop a prayer life. That's one of the things that I want to help them imitate during this season, to, to put in a predictable pattern offer really concrete uh, things that they can imitate. The thing um, for all of us to remember as leaders is your life is the best example, but you don't have to be a perfect example. I think some of us feel that pressure to offer a perfect, perfect example, but you don't have to be a perfect example. You just get to be a living one. That's great, Gina. And it's a good uh, reminder that when you're sharing life with people, the imitation comes from them simply watching you. But when you're connecting with people at a distance, you have to tell them. That's the only way they can see your example. So don't be shy about doing what, they, what Gina just modeled. And that is tell them what, what you're doing so that they can see it in that sense. All right, well, that brings us to our fourth strategy, which is recognize the season. Um, Jesus said uh, to the disciples when he met the woman at the Samaritan well, he, he said that the season was that after four months comes the harvest. <laughs> and he was showing them that the fields were, were white or ripe for harvest. And, and Jesus was a discerner of seasons. And you, you can see that even in the way that he structured his daily, weekly seasonal occasional life he had these rhythms in his life of abiding and bearing fruit and that was his daily rhythm that was his weekly rhythm that was a, a a seasonal and even an occasional rhythm and he was very intentional about seasons of rest seasons of work and uh and, and we see how the the fruitfulness of jesus is the abundant life that he promises in john 10 um, that, that abundant life is a life of fruitfulness. And that's the picture he gives us in John 15 of, of the vine and the branches, that it's as we are abiding in him, the vine, that we become the most fruitful. 
And so one thing that our current uh, kind of crisis does is it, it brings us to recognize what season we're in and what are the opportunities of this season. And I think one mistake that some church leaders are making is that they're just plowing ahead as it trying to kind of act as if nothing's happened and trying to do everything that they were doing before, just doing it all online or something like that. And I think it's so important as if we're going to really follow Jesus' example that we discern the season and that we ask God, what are you saying? What are you doing in this time and in this season? And a time like this calls for a different approach and a different rhythm. And maybe that means this is an abiding season. It's certainly a pruning season, isn't it? Because so many things are being taken away from us. And so pruning is what leads us back to a place of abiding. And it's not always easy. It's not always fun. It's not always comfortable. But it's always worthwhile. It's always fruitful when we let the, the vine grower, our Heavenly Father, do the pruning. And so for us as leaders, it's so critical right now that we really ask God, what are you saying and what are you doing in this season? And wh what is the pruning that you want to do? It would, be, it would be a shame if we miss the opportunity of the pruning that God wants to do in this time. And there may be things that would be difficult to prune and maybe even more costly for you to kind of initiate the pruning. But now in this season, it gives you a perfect excuse, if you will, a perfect opportunity to do some of the pruning that needs to be done. So what are some of the things that have been taking time and energy from you your leadership team, your, your community that are really not bearing fruit. Well, maybe this is a time to, to prune those um, and it, it makes sense to do that. So uh, we just wanna really encourage you to, to think prayerfully about what does this season call for and what is God saying to you in this particular season about pruning and abiding versus growth and fruit bearing? That's good. Strategy number five is train, equip, empower. So as, we, as we're talking about leading a scattered church, when, when you're leading a scattered church, the primary role of the senior leader is to equip their team, not to be the center of everything. And so if you notice how Jesus led, he was really intentional about investing in his team so that eventually he could get out of the way and let them lead. And I'm, I'm, I'm continuously struck by the fact that after resurrection, so, you know, salvation is done. It's, it's finished, right? After the, the power of the resurrection, Jesus didn't come back as leader of the pack. And, you know, I'm, I mean, he's the most skilled and the most anointed. He could have continued this amazing ministry to the crowds right? Post-resurrection, yeah? But instead, um, he continued to give it all away to the people that he led. And I, I'm, I think about there, there truly couldn't be a bigger gap in competency of leadership between Jesus and his disciples. I mean, it was Jesus, yeah? Son of God. So as we're talking about, you know, what it looks like to pass on leadership to those that we're investing in, there truly couldn't have been a bigger gap in competency between Jesus and his disciples. And yet he still gave it all away. And so when it came time for the church to scatter, things multiplied because his team just knew what to do under pressure when all the rules changed, right? They just carried on. And so for us, um, our primary job right now isn't to do everything that will fundamentally wear you out. But if you're able to resource your team, to resource, train, equip your group leaders to really shepherd and care for the people in their groups, right? If you've got missional communities, invest in your missional community leaders. Um, invest in them as they're, you know, trying to figure out how to care for their, how to shepherd their community through uh, a virtual space, how to care for their people right now. So as you're investing and in training and equipping, you get to give more access, provide more opportunity for access for your team, um, give, offer more guidance to your leaders, offer more space to your team to process how it's going, 
But this really gets to be the time that you release those that you've invested in, those that you've equipped, they get to lead now. So remember our language that we use for this is you've already done the recruiting. So now you get to train, deploy, and review. Train, deploy, review. So good, Gina. Love that. Uh, our, uh, what is it? Our sixth strategy is orbits of relationship. And uh, it, it is interesting when you look at Jesus that he had a very intentional way of connecting with people, but he didn't connect with all people in exactly the same way or the same frequency. And this is what we in 3DM often talk about orbits. You know, orbits can be closer, they can be longer orbits, um, but these are key relationships that you're investing in. And in a time of social isolation, as the, as the phrase literally means, it seems like, well, how can we be investing in relationships when we're all isolated? Well, uh, that's part of the beauty of the technology that we have, just like we're doing now, is that we are able. And, and in some ways, it's interesting, in our overly busy society and culture, uh, there's almost, in some ways, more opportunities to make relational connections now uh, because people are forced into a place of, of, uh, of kind of being at home and having more time and less activity on their hand. And so, again, this is an opportunity for us to really consider what are the, what are the relational orbits that we're investing in and how are we training and empowering our people and our leaders to be intentional about those as well? And so the, the three that we really want to think about are first is the closest orbit, and that is who are the people that you are literally sharing a house with, that, that you're you know, sheltered at home with? That might be a nuclear family. That might be just a spouse. Uh, Gina has got nine people in her household right now uh, of all different uh, ages. And so, you know, it's going to be different for everybody, but uh, who, are, who are the people that you're sheltered in place with? And, and what does it mean to take this opportunity to intentionally function more as a family on mission together? And you're all probably familiar with our language and tools and even the little book by the Breen's Family on Mission. And that really it's about establishing those predictable patterns that Gina talked about up, in, and out. That's how you build a family on mission. And so, so how are we helping people with that in terms of what are they, how are they functioning with the people that they're sheltered in place with? And can they do that in a more Jesus-shaped way and, and think about it as building a family on mission? The second orbit we want to think about is just discipling relationships of which your family on mission are your primary ones, but there's going to be other relationships uh, where there's an opportunity to really be more intentional about investing and discipling. And uh, this, is a, this is a time when people are more open to joining small groups maybe than ever before because they're stuck at home and they have time and they're kind of longing for more connection. And so what a great time to, to invite people into online groups. And uh, they don't necessarily have to be called huddles but they can, have, uh, they can have the process of Kairos identification and the processing of what is God saying to me? What does he want me to do about that? There can be an intentional discipling culture that you start to apply to that. And so uh, there's some you know, resources. We've got books like uh, Jesus Shaped Life, which is a very accessible book uh, that you could have some small groups uh, led around that. Uh, we've got a free PDF um, a guide for a 12 week kind of study of that, that you could do in small groups. Same thing with Empowering Missional Disciples. Uh, Cesar Kalinowski has that great book, The Gospel Primer, which is a great way to kind of train and equip people on how to live and articulate the gospel. Um, so, so lots of resources that could be used there. Uh, the third one that we want you to think about is just extended missional family, oikos. And, uh, and maybe this is a thing where you could uh, gather people by their neighborhoods or by their networks. Uh, you could, you know, identify your leaders geographically or using other kind of networks and uh, ask them to invite in uh, a gathering of people that they could start to connect with as spiritual family. In fact, you, Matthew Kaliba is on the call from Fernie. He was just telling me that they've done this where every member of their church has been identified under 
a different leader within the church, and that leader is connecting with them in different ways. And wouldn't this be a great way of setting the stage for missional community? If you, if you don't have a developed network of missional communities, it, you could function in a way during this season that could set the stage for people after social isolation is lifted to say, hey, we really want to keep connecting. We want to keep gathering as a neighborhood or as a network or whatever. So what a great opportunity to, uh, to do that. And, uh, and to think about it missionally, even like things like Alpha has uh, gone completely online. And so you could run an Alpha course as a neighborhood group or as a missional community or something like that. So lots of ways just thinking about how are you being intentional about continuing to build the relational orbits that are going to help reinforce and develop a discipling culture. That's good. I think that helps uh, remove the pastor from being at the center or the, the, the senior leader um, from being at the center because you're really dispersing ministry out to the edges where everybody gets to engage in ministry and really, and during this time, elevating the shepherds, right? Those that are really good at caring for their people that now they have people to really uh, to care for. It's great. Strategy number seven is what are you counting? So uh, in other words, what are we measuring to assess how people are engaging with Jesus during this time? What are our metrics when everything has changed overnight? right? We're in the middle of pandemic and isolation and economic challenges. And so the things that we used to count and measure perhaps aren't quite as relevant right now, right? Um, we've completely overhauled the way that we are um, encouraging people to connect. And so though you, can, though you can count, you can look at how many people are connecting virtually to the thing that's online, right? But I, I mean, that can't be our only metric for if people are connecting with the church, right? And, and families are reeling and, and lots of people are out of work right now. And so we can't really use how much offering is coming in the offering plate as a way to measure how much they're engaging in church or, you know, engaging in, in their walk with Jesus. And so again, what are we counting? What's our metric? What are we looking at there? Um, as we look at the things that Jesus counted and measured, it was always disciples. That's what he was counting. That's what he was measuring. And so as, as, as you're looking at how Jesus measured that or how he counted it, it was always having to do with their journey in growing and maturing in their journey with God. So how do we measure that in this season? Could we put some language to the, the way that people are engaging with Jesus during this season, does that offer us a different, um, more helpful metric? So some examples, is there a way that we could possibly measure or count people's creativity around what mission looks like right now and how people are thinking about their neighbors or those that live in close proximity to them and how they're you know, creatively reaching out and caring for them and making sure that needs are met? Can we measure that? Could we find a way to measure how people are growing in their ability to, to hear God's voice and take radical steps of obedience? How could we measure that? Um, could we measure how people are creatively connecting with each other or reaching out to people checking in? Could we measure uh, the leaders that we've invested in and, and the ones that we're encouraging to step out and lead? Could we, could we measure how our leaders are doing at taking courageous steps of, of leadership in their circles of relationship? Could we measure families that are learning how to spiritually parent uh, their kids and those living in their household during this season? Could we somehow measure households that are developing new predictable patterns in this season that recalibrate how they're living the ways of Jesus? I, I wonder how we could put language to measuring those things that are that that elevates discipleship more than counting numbers that feels a, a little bit elusive or irrelevant right now right there truly has never been um, a better time for you to let your vision and values shape your vehicles and your valuation your valuation is what you count so in other words as you're putting language to your vision and you're naming the things that you truly value you can build around that. So this is an opportunity for 
It's, it's open season for a reset, right? And if discipleship and mission are high on the priority list, and if you've, if you've been wanting to reorient everything that you do in some way to help people become disciples and live a missional lifestyle, to grow the character and competencies of Jesus, rather than simply being an organization that produces spiritual goods and services for people to, to show up and consume, there's never been a more open invitation for you to do that. The entire world has changed. And so as you're putting in place virtual ways for people to worship, for them to connect, um, cast vision for why you're doing it the way that you're doing it by using simple language that helps people connect what you're doing to the ways of Jesus. That's the language piece. It's so important. Language creates culture, right? And so use the language of your vision and values often. Repeat them. Say them over and over again. And put language uh, to what you do want to measure during this season that more accu accurately represents a measuring stick for how people are engaging with Jesus and growing in their faith and maturity during this time. All these things that you're resetting and, and reorienting, they can set you up for um, the, the new normal, whatever that means, um, that's coming into the future, right? So again, you've been given a beautiful opportunity for a reset. So create this new normal around your vision and values. There's, there's truly never been a better time. That's awesome, Gina. Another thought that came to me is that you tend to report what you value. And in this season, wouldn't it be great to be doing some uh, video testimonies uh, of people telling stories about what they're doing that does reflect your vision and values? And that would be a way of sort of saying, this is what we count, basically. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, our last one, strategy number eight, is a Jesus-shaped life. And uh, as I think you're all familiar with, we think of Jesus' life in three dimensions, up with the Father, in with the disciples, and out with the world. And if discipleship uh, is truly being formed by Christ, if, if follow me means model your life after mine and let my life shape yours, then up, in, and out will become increasingly the dimensions and the dynamics of our lives as well. And so in this season, it's just interesting to apply uh, that fundamental template to our own lives, the lives of those that we're leading in our communities, and to really ask the question, what does a Jesus-shaped like, shape life look like in a time of pandemic, in a time of quarantine and, and social isolation? And, um, and to really be kind of training your people uh, to, to use this, to use Jesus as the model for how they're shaping their lives in this crazy, weird situation that nobody's ever faced before. And uh, it's, it's so easy for people to kind of default into what is the, the lowest common denominator? What is the easiest factor? And so, you know, people are sitting at home watching Netflix or whatever and uh, missing so many opportunities that this season presents. And so what does it look like to really be stepping into the up dimension when you're isolated at home? You know, in some ways, maybe that's the easiest one because you can never isolate us from the Holy Spirit, right? God is always present. He's always there. Um, but it would be a mistake to kind of just default to only seeing this as a time for developing spiritual disciplines, let's say. You know, again, as we talked about with relational orbits in there are, there are lots of opportunities with the people that we're physically sort of locked down with, uh, but also with people that we can connect with like this online. And so what are the opportunities to develop intentional in rhythms? As we said, maybe use this as a chance to really press into discipleship. Um, but the one I think that's maybe the most challenging that we might feel the, the least empowered to do is out. And it would be a mistake to think of this as, okay, this is just an up and in season and we'll have to wait to do out later until we can get out and mingle with people or whatever. No, again, that's not a Jesus-shaped life. And for church people, up and in is the default, right? We tend to resist out uh, more than any of the other dimensions. And so what a, what a great opportunity this is. Again, going back to reframe the mission, to, to refocus on what, what is our true calling and how are we connecting 
with people. I know for me, we've, we've built relationships on our blocks with our neighbors. And so this has been a great chance to, you know, I've got a text thread of about 19 of my neighbors going. And early on, I started texting that, that group and saying, hey, how's everybody doing? This is what's going on with us. Uh, we're going to Costco tomorrow. Can we pick up anything for you? Does anybody have any needs? Is, it, is everybody healthy? You know, all those kinds of things. So there's, there's ways that we can continue to connect with our neighbors. I know for me, I've been working on my backyard. And so the neighbors on either side over the fence, <laughs> we've been passing uh, you know, food and tools and different things back to each other over the fence. And so even that little bit of proximity with appropriate, you know, hygienics and, and all has been a great way to interact with our neighbors there. So in any case, it's just a great way to kind of continue to ask the question, what does it look like to live a Jesus-shaped life under these particular circumstances? And, and what a great way to kind of prepare people for uh, continuing in that mindset after the season changes. All right, Gina, Excellent. we did it. Hour and 45, 45 minutes. We got we through worked eight. real hard to keep it tight and concise. <laughs> All right, guys. So we want to have some conversation around this. Uh, what are you thinking about? What questions do you have um, as you're processing your own context and how to really, truly, practically put some of these things in practice? What are you wondering about? What would be helpful to have more examples of? Where do you have questions? You can type them in the chat or just unmute your microphone. I have a question um, regarding strategy six. Um, and you talked about like the first point is who you're sheltering with. And uh, just for people who are living alone, what would you have to say to that? For example, like myself, I'm the lead pastor and I live alone. All my family is in another province and there are quite a few people in our congregation who are either widowed or um, yeah, have, don't have family close by. Yeah, so um, I mean, obviously the, the online connections or other kinds of digital connections are going to be critical if you're literally by yourself during this time. And I, I think that is a really important consideration for singles and for other people who really literally are by themselves. So in some ways you have, you have a great opportunity to, because that's your situation, you have a chance to kind of lift that up and model that for others in your community that face the same challenge. But you know, uh, for you, obviously it's gonna be figuring out who are the closest people that I really want to be connecting with consistently online and maybe even have some daily rhythms. You know, maybe we say we meet every morning for prayer, uh, the five or six of us or whatever that are the closest. And maybe it's others that are in similar situations. I'm, you know, for me, we're empty nesters, so it's me and my wife. And this is a great, you know, a great test of your marriage relationship when you're locked down with your spouse. Um, so, so yeah, you have to reach out beyond yourself for sure if you're by by yourself. Gina, do you have some thoughts? Uh, I, I would say the same thing. I think, too, as you're thinking about what you need, I think during this season, we all have to, as, as leaders, we're, I tend to think strategy. I'll put myself. I tend to constantly be thinking strategy. Um, and I've had to allow myself space to say, how am I really doing? And what do I need? What do I need? Um, as a human right now, it, when everything is crazy, what do I need today? And honestly, it's different from day to day. And so I've noticed that there's certain days that my capacity is tapped. Um, and as much as I would love to plow through my to-do list, that's just not going to happen. Um, and so for you living alone, I wonder what, uh, you know, allowing yourself space um, to name what you need and having, having, you know, close people that you, that will help kind of fill those needs for you. But then as Bob said, huge opportunity to model that for other singles um, and, and those that are living alone in your church. And I wonder if there's places of connection um, that you can offer either virtually over free conference call or something um, for the, for the others that are lonely and don't have a support network to connect in with too. That's a great well, question, Leah. Thank you. One, uh, one thing we've been doing, because our kids and grandkids live nearby, but we can't see them right now. 
and so we've been doing meals together with them like once a week or so and and we literally uh, we we drop off food at their house and then we all gather on zoom and kind of eat the meal together and uh, and i think there'll be some reciprocity where they'll drop food off as well so that might be something too as a single person to think about having a, a dinner party or different you know ways of connecting even just just socially with people so you're not eating all your meals alone. See, we've got a couple of good questions coming in the chat. Gina, do you want to pick one? Um, sure. Um, okay, how can you help ease the transition of decentralization for leaders and the congregation because it's painful for both sides? That's a great question. Um, I think my observation is that one of the things that the church in general has not been great at is lament and offering space uh, to name grief and things that are hard. I think sometimes we put on our happy church face and we show up and assume that we have to have everything all figured out. Um, there's been some unhelpful language around, you know, fears and anxiety and all sorts of stuff and some pressure that if you are a believer that those things shouldn't exist. So there's been some unhelpful responses and I think creating space, um, in my experience, the, being able to name what's hard and put language to grief is a really helpful way to ease up some of those transition pieces. I don't know if you would add to that, Bob. Yeah, I, I love that, Gene. I think that's so biblical and so important, uh, countercultural. Um, I also think that uh, highlighting that there are losses, but there are also gains. And so without flip-flopping to the happy face thing Gino's talking about, you can also match lament with helping people see the opportunities and the new life that, that decentralization is bringing. That yeah, we're, we've lost this, but look, here's what we're gaining. And so uh, helping people to see the opportunities I think can be mm -hmm. encouraging as well. Yeah. And like we talked about before, having language that helps like place it for people. So if you can help uh, like, cat, like find a category to put this in, right? So if we're not able to meet together, um, how do we help give handles for people and how that, how, how are we accomplishing our vision as a church now? Because it looks real different to the way that it looked five weeks ago. And so if we can use the language that we've developed around vision and values and um, point people to, this is, this is how we're as a church responding. I don't think there's a one size fits all uh, response right now to what every church should be doing, right? So you've, the work that you as a leader get to do is contextualizing for your context. That's always gonna be your job. And saying well, first filter is what's God saying? What's he doing around us and how do we respond to that? Um, so as you're doing that as a leader, saying what's God saying and how do we together as a community respond to that, find language to help give people handles so that they really can see this is how we together are going to be, you know, living the ways of Jesus in this season. And this is how it matches what we value together. Because they had a different, whole different, you know, set of expectations for what church looked like and that got completely turned on its head. Mm. And so now to find language to explain it. Um, even like referencing the history of Christians, the history of where the church has been, you know, over, um, you know, pandemics of all generations <laughs> is kind of even a helpful placement yeah, that we're not yeah. the first ones to go through this. See, Paul Sorensen has asked a question, how would you navigate pruning while integrating these new ideas? Mm. And uh, I think, you know, the, one way to do that is to frame this as for this season, we're going to stop doing such and such. So rather than saying we're never going to do this again or whatever, it's that whole experimental thing gives you permission to do things. So I think that's one way to do it. I think being very intentional with your leaders and your team and asking the question, what are the things that are not necessary and maybe even not helpful in this season and can we set those aside at least for the season and then reassess uh, you know, later? Because yeah, you, you're all doing new things, you're adding new things in. So if you're gonna add new things in, you've got to be willing to take some things out or it's just gonna become unsustainable. Great, good. Anyone else thinking about anything? 
questions. We've got a couple questions in the chat box. Maybe they're just coming to me. Um, how do we resist the tendency to wait for everything to just go back to normal and pick up as we left off? I think that's a great question David asked. Mm -hmm. uh, John Cotter's book on change, he, he has what he calls the rubber band effect, that if you can affect a change, but there can be this rubber band of memory that as soon as you let up pressure on it, it snaps back to the way it was. And if this is a season where God wants to do something new and create more of a discipling culture and a missional movement in your community, definitely going to have to be intentional about, about figuring out how those changes are you going to shift sorry did I, did I get frozen you're cutting out a little bit bob for a minute there cool that's a good thought though the rubber band effect so, sorry, I got locked up there. You did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, just being strategic about how you are going to make these things the new normal uh, yeah. and not just automatically go back to the way you used to function. Yeah. I think too, um, if, this, if we really were only finding a quick fix that really was just getting us by for a couple weeks, then it, then it makes sense why you just wait it out right? Everyone's just going to wait it out till this goes away. And then we go back to a new normal. But I think this is hanging on for, you know, a few months at least. And then we don't know. And the longer that it goes, um, and if we're able to really be thinking deeply about how we lead this time to really truly go after making missional disciples, we're all changing in this weird in between. This is like, it's not static. Time isn't standing still, right? We're all experiencing this crazy thing together. And so we're going to come out on the other side of this changed. And so I think um, that's a helpful way of looking at, we, we actually don't have to go back to the way things were and just reinstitute everything that used to exist because we're all changing. And as we lead people through and shepherd people through um, these, these months, we're all going to come out, hopefully, um, different on the other side. Amen. Let's see, Robin asks, any suggestions for working with parishioners who are resistant to engaging online? Things started out well for us, but I'm starting to see some fraying at the edges. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that, do you have some thoughts, Gina? I was just going to say, any ways that we can increase connection? Um, in other words, connection over content right? Mm -hmm. Like really going after relational connection. Um, Bob offered some helpful um, thoughts around how do we think about organizing our people into like relational connection groups. So everybody's got somebody calling them on whatever rhythm feels helpful. Um, and so as people, as you're noticing who's not connecting, if, you're, if your group is at a size where you notice who's not there, um, really reaching out and kind of going after that relational connection, I think is just really helpful. Any of the organized structure, whether it's huddles or groups or missional communities, the, the places where people are already organized into groups, I think feels like a natural place of connection. It's the ones that aren't connected into those groups that are trickier, right? And so I think finding, like some of you have mentioned other creative ways that you're organizing around where people live, like what part of the city they're in, or networks of some sort, to help kind of offer some, um, you know, way of grouping people so that there's increased connection. So if they're not, if there's not a willingness to connect through an, like an online virtual space, I wonder if there's just a, a much more like organic relational way to- Yeah, I mean, yeah. in this particular case, we were, you know, it's been a case of keeping up with them by the phone, obviously, but it's older members of the community yeah. who, you know, mm -hmm. were, you know, I can't figure out this Zoom thing. And they did figure it out. But then, you know, the dynamics, the, the dynamics of having a conversation on the screen are different yeah. Yeah. from the dynamics of being in a room. And yeah. where they're used to being in a room. It was a little challenging. So I'm having to do some extra TLC on that. But I just didn't know if um, I'm, 
concerned that you know the whole initial rah rah of having everybody on in online groups it worked well for a few weeks uh, i'm just concerned about like what ha what starts happening when this starts to devolve <laughs> but i think i think one of the keys there is that you make the time that you are connecting online more relational and more interactive which is what mm. gina means by connection over content and yep. so making sure that you're giving you know people time to interact with each other uh, there's ways that, you know, Zoom, of course, is interactive. If you're doing YouTube stuff, you can also have people commenting or doing different things. So finding ways to make it more interactive and more relational. Also, just old fashioned things. Somebody put here uh, letter writing and postcards are, can be huge. If you're organized geographically, like walking around the neighborhood and putting something in everybody's mailbox, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is a great way. Um, phone, phone, good old fashioned phone calls, obviously. I mentioned talking over the fence. You know, you've seen people doing drive by birthday parades or whatever. You know, th there may be other, like Gina said, organic ways of connecting with people that transcend online stuff. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Well, you guys, I realize that we're at time and I want to be respectful of your time. There's a couple things that I want to just invite you into if it feels helpful. Um, we did record this and so we'll be sending out the recording if this feels helpful to you to have the recording to share with people in your community or others around you. Um, I'm going to be sending it out in the upcoming 3DM newsletter. And so if you're not already getting the weekly kind of like movement wide newsletter, type your email in the chat box and we'll help you get sus subscribed to that. And this recording will be uh, in that newsletter coming up as well as um, the 12 week study guide for Jesus Shaped Life um, that Bob is offering as well for free. A uh, couple other things, if you are not currently in a coaching huddle for 3DM, we're offering free um, huddles for eight weeks, just as a way to connect uh, with other leaders that are processing through like-minded things of what does mission and discipleship look like in our context and what's going like what is being unearthed in me as a leader right now and, and a space to process that so if that feels helpful to you um, that's coming out in the newsletter this coming week um, on how you can sign up for um, getting connected to uh, that eight-week huddle and then if you've already been through a learning community with us um, one of the things that we found really helpful is our alumni network. And so if you're not already connected to a network, um, please reach out to me um, or put, put a little thing here in the chat and I can follow up with you. We'd love to help you get connected to a network. Those are typically by regions. And so um, our favorite thing, if possible, is to help you connect with um, other people that are living near you and have a similar uh, missional context. So. Would love to invite you into those things as well. Um, we'll continue to put out um, more resources. Um, if you have things that you're thinking about as it relates to leading in the season and missional discipleship that would be really helpful, um, we'd love to get your feedback. Um, we'd love to have, you know, host more webinars or conversations that feel really pertinent and helpful for you. And so let us know what you need. Uh, reach out to us, um, feed us ideas. We'd love to to help you in that way. Cool. Yes. And we are hoping to do more webinars more regularly. So keep your eyes open for that.